call the meeting to order, please. Before we hear the two cases today, I have um, the guidelines by which this meeting is conducted. This is a public hearing, and we are the Zoning Board of Adjustments for Putnam County, Florida. We operate under the authority of Articles 11 and 12 of the Land Development Code as amended. The primary responsibility of the board is to hear and decide appeals challenging final determinations made by the Planning and Development Services Department under the Land Development Code and to hear and act upon requests for variances, special use permits, non-conforming use determinations, and preliminary development plans under the development code, land development code. We have a variance is a relaxation of the requirements of the zoning code in a particular case where, because of unusual circumstances, a literal enforcement of the zoning code would result in undue or unnecessary hardship. The zoning code permits us to authorize variances for height, size of structure, size of yards, and open spaces. If we grant a variance, we may impose reasonable condition on the use of the property which must be satisfied if the variance is to remain valid. The standards we use in deciding whether or not to grant a variance are listed in section 45-833 of the Land Development Code. A special use permit is special permission to use property in a fashion which the zoning classification of the property does not automatically permit. If we grant a special use permit, we may impose reasonable conditions on the use of the property which must be satisfied if the special use permit is to remain valid. Unlike a change in the zoning classification, as a general rule, a special use permit applies only to <coughs> the specific use requested in the application for a special use permit. The standards we use in deciding whether or not to grant a special use permit are listed in section 45-1083 of the Land Development Code. Procedurally, we will call this case by name and number. A member of the staff will then briefly explain to us the nature of each request. We will then take any comments from the applicant or their representative, followed by any public comments concerning the request. Please direct all comments and statements to the board and not to other people in the audience. Before speaking, we will ask each person to be recognized, come forward to the lectern, and identify his or herself by name and address. After all persons wishing to speak have been heard, we will entertain a motion from the board. This, board will be, this motion will be voted on by the board members and become our final order. Any decision made by this board can be appealed to the circuit court. However, any appeal must be filed within 30 days after the Board of Adjustments had, has rendered the final order which is being appealed. Are there any questions? Okay, before the first case is heard, all those wishing to speak today must be sworn in. So will the notary please administer the oath. Okay, the first case today is 21-008. This is an application for a sawmill where the wood is from trees grown on the site of the, saw, of, the, of the sawmill. It's in the agricultural district. The applicant is Frank Buckles. The location is 1289 State Road 19 Palatka. The future land use is urban reserve. The zoning district is agriculture. The, back, uh, the property is zoned agriculture and contains 4.28 acres. The property is currently under code enforcement, case number 2021-00130, for operation of a sawmill using trees from other locations and for other several, several unpermitted buildings. The applicant is in the process of bringing the unpermitted buildings into compliance. The property is not designated as green belted as verified through the Putnam County property appraiser. The property is not shown to be within a special flood hazard area, and but there is a slight wetland located along the south mid to rear property line and will be further depicted in maps as shown. This is the aerial, the zoning district, mm -hmm. agriculture, future land use. That is the location of the wetland area, that little bubble. The special use permit criteria. The use is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets all the concurrency requirements. The subject property is located along a minor arterial classified roadway, State Road 19, 
The proposed sawmill activity requires that all wood be used in the operation be grown on site, and the operator of the sawmill will be responsible for ensuring that all agricultural activities comply with the best management practices as provided in policy A1.4.9 and identical policy of E1.3.5. The use is allowed as a special use within the zoning district. The sec section 45-72D2 of the Land Development Code specifically states that agricultural related commercial uses referred to as commercial agricultural related in the LDC requires a special use permit to locate within the agricultural district. Upon approval of the special use permit, the sawmill will be required to undergo the development review process through which the additional improvements as well as the existing development would, be, would demonstrate compliance with the development requirements in the Land Development Code. Special use would not adversely impact nor unduly restrict the enjoyment of permitted uses in the surrounding area. The surrounding parcels zoned agricultural contain single family homes. The proposed sawmill provided that only site grown trees are to be used is not anticipated to have an adverse impact or undue, undue restrictions based on the limited scale of the use. Staff has proposed conditions that are listed at the end that will mitigate uh, for noise associated with the operation. The, spe the special use will not substantially diminish or impair property values in the area. The property is required to use only trees, again, grown on the site. The property is only 4.28 acres. Um, the milling of wood would be limited to the trees, of course, again, existing on site, and the scope being so limited, doesn't we don't anticipate major issues. Adequate access roads, on-site parking. The site will go through the development review process to ensure the compliance with the LDC. Adequate measures have been taken to provide ingress and egress of the property. The current property has a residential type uh, driveway. Um, it will have to go and be reviewed by DOT for the different for the development during the development review process. Adequate screening and buffering of the special use will be provided. The property abuts residentially zoned properties. Section 45.513, table 703A, states a type 10A buffer is required along property lines which abut the agricultural district. Landscaping of any vehicular use areas or any kind of business type things would be required to have, will be determined at development review. The special use will not, ha will not have any signs or exterior lighting. No signage is proposed and the lighting will be reviewed for compliance at the time of development review. There will be no undue risks to persons or persons from hazardous substances. Staff is not aware of any hazardous substance, substances proposed, sorry about that, um, for the sawmill operation. Um, staff has proposed a condition prohibiting the treatment of wood products with chromated copper arse arsenate preservatives normally associated with treated woods. This condition is proposed because the residential setting of the site is not considered appropriate for such an intense chemical process. Um, more uh, properly situated in industrial, that would be more for an industrial style zoning. The proposed special use will not adversely affect the general public health, safety, and welfare of the residents of Putnam County. The proposed use as limited uh, and conditioned by staff would be consistent with the urban reserve future land use and the agricultural zoning and should not adversely affect the general public health, safety, welfare, or the residents of Putnam County. The applicant has requested a special use to allow a sawmill where wood is grown from, tre is from trees grown on the site in the Ag District. Upon approval of the special use permit, the applicant will be required to go through development review process and meet all requirements self set forth in land development code and any conditions that may be added by the board. Staff re recommends approval subject to these five conditions. As stipulated by the LDC 45-59, all trees used in the operation of the sawmill shall be grown and harvested on the subject 4.28 acre site. No additional wood material shall be allowed to be processed as part of the sawmill operation on the premises. 
Violation of this condition will result in the revocation of the special use permit. The impregnating and or saturation of wood products on the subject site using chromated copper arsenate preservatives shall be prohibited. A 10 foot wide type A buffer incorporating components as described in Article 7 shall be installed along any residential property line adjacent to view of the sawmill operation. The action of cutting wood using mechanically operated saw shall be required to be contained within an enclosed building. And number five, all existing and future buildings on the site shall be properly permitted through the Department of, of Planning and Development Services prior to the commencement of the sawmill operation. The applicant is here um, for questions and if you have any questions of staff. Do you have any questions for staff? I do. Okay, got a question for you. On um, the staff analysis under D, and also um, it says that the milling of wood would be limited to the trees existing on the site and, uh, and any additional trees that may be planted in the future. Okay, I noticed that there are a lot of logs, you know, the trees have already been cut. Are those gonna be permitted to be sawn at that time? I'm gonna address that. No, in a minute, okay. I'm asking staff. If it's currently, anything that's currently on site, we are assuming that it came from site. So yes, anything that is currently sitting on the site today. Okay, all right. Just, and what type of buffer are you going to require? Because um, when I was out there, it's, there was a house, I think on the left, and there was probably one on the right farther down. So are you going to require that they plant uh, a fence, uh, it I mean, would, not plant a fence, but plant trees and or put up a fence? It, it would be um, of vegetation. It would be, depending on when we go through the development review process, depend, uh, it may, may well be a fence or some sort of barrier. Madam Chair, if I may address that, um, the, type, the type 10A buffer currently allows for either a wood fence or vegetation. Um, if so, and that's condition number three in staff's recommended conditions. If the board desires to make that a more substantial buffer, you may do so um, by requiring an additional component in that buffer. But currently, the way we have the condition written, it's either six foot evergreen vegetation or a six foot fence along any area that's uh, adjoining the structures that will be used for the sawmill. Okay, the structure itself, because the structure sits way back in the back, so. Correct. There so, was a fence, so I couldn't get through the fence today, but, you know, it looked like that there was quite a bit of overgrowth in that, in that area, but. Yes, ma'am, so the, it would only have to be placed in the immediate area of the um, operation. Oh, okay, so. So it wouldn't be the entire property. Okay. Uh, any other questions for staff? Okay, at this time, uh, let's do a site visit roll call, please. Earl Ballantry? Yes. Mark Fisher? Yes. Ed Tilly Brew? Yes. Linda Osborne? Yes. Mark Webb? Yes. Okay. I'm assuming uh, the gentleman standing in front of us is Frank, Frank Buckles? No, ma'am. Okay. Would I you please identify yourself? Give us your name and address for the yes, record. Yes, ma'am. Justin Morris, 180 Stokes Landing Road. Justin, what was your last Morris, name? Morris, M-O-R-R-I-S. All right. Um, I want to make one adjustment to the things that she said there. She said the adjacent properties were residential. Um, they are zoned ag, both to the north and to the south of the subject property. They are not residential properties. Yes, they have a house on them. But according to the property search right here, it says the property to the north is ag zoning. So we are situated, we are agricultural, situated between two agriculturally zoned properties. Uh, so let me say, let me, uh, let me start off with, my name is Justin Morris. I'm uh, uh, Mr. Gary Buckles and Frank Buckles approached me back in March when they received their letter. Um, Mr. Gary passed away in June, kind of dropped it all in Frank's lap to finish this up and I'm helping them coordinate with it. I'm currently, a, I'm a building contractor, 
state certified building contractor. I've worked for the county for years as a building inspector, and I'm currently the building official for the town of Wallaca. So they approached me because of my experience and expertise in having been in the code book and been in understanding uh, interpretations of some of what's going on here. And they, 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 they're just not familiar with it. So I'm helping them through this process. <clears throat> I understand gray areas in the code. And I understand that sometimes government officials, they're relatively indifferent because it's their job to just interpret what they see. Um, and very often it is very hard for uh, people that are doing it for a living to uh, back up on a stance once they establish a position. Um, in my professional career, I have tried to the air on the side of what is most helpful to the people that I'm, I'm advocating for and that I am, I am trying to help. I'm hoping that's what happens here. Um, that we have here an issue of, of perceived non-compliance in that uh, the buckles have a, a portable bandsaw located on a piece of property. It has been there for almost 20 years. Um, it is on a piece that has been family owned since 1981 um, and has been continuously used. It's not used a lot. It's not a, it's not a commercial, it's not something that he is making a living there. Um, but because they can, they can put the word sawmill on it, there's a, there's a, that's what they're going off of. So when, when I say sawmill, what the general public and what normal people, the people that put this code together, when they think sawmill, what they would think is a big saw blade, conveyor belts, uh, trolleys that carry the wood, um, Lots of high production type work. Uh, Truckloads of logs coming in, semi trucks of lumber and whatnot going out. We have in this county two industrial level sawmills. We have one, the East Palaka Sawmill on Turner Road in East Palaka, and the mulch plant on Highway 17 north of town, just before you get to the county line. Both of those are what you would expect to see when you say sawmill. They have large saws, they produce large volumes, they deal with large number of truckloads of logs coming in and lumber going out. <clears throat> That's not what this is. This is a portable sawmill, a portable bandsaw. It is on a trailer that can be hooked to a vehicle and moved off site in five minutes. It is a bandsaw powered by the equivalent of a lawnmower engine, a 25 or 30 horse Kohler engine, no different than what your neighbor has on their zero turn mower. So this is not the industrial strength sawmill that it's trying to get classified as. Um, both the East Palaka sawmill and the uh, sawmill at the mulch plant sit on agricultural property. I'm assuming since there was no response from, from zoning on when I questioned them about the East Palaka sawmill that there's no, there has been no issue with the East Palaka sawmill just because maybe it's been there for so long. But how it, this board did issue special use permit in 05 to the mulch plant for their sawmill. Um, so it is understandable that you need a special use permit for a sawmill of that industrial strength and we're, 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 we are in agreement that it can go in an agriculturally zoned property. <clears throat> but what Mr. Buckles has on a trailer because of its limited scope and its limited abilities, it does not produce a lot of wood. It doesn't produce a lot of lumber. He's not, for the sake of argument, he's not really a commercial business there. Yes, he has sold um, a little bit of wood here and there, but the bulk of it he gives away or barters, trades with, and there are not, there are not trailers, trucks and trailers of wood coming in and out of there daily or even weekly. The wood that shows up on that site is typically given to him um, 
or a byproduct of maybe site clearing or something where he's only picking up one or two trees at the time. He's in a unique situation right now because he had somebody that did some land clearing that had a bunch of logs that needed to go somewhere and Frank just was, as being a generous neighbor, said, yes, you can put them there. We'll saw some of them up if you want to. But it is not, that was not a money, but that was him being a good neighbor to someone else. <clears throat> the, typically, well, without a doubt, logs do not come into that property on a semi-truck. And lumber does not leave that property on a semi-truck. The goods and services, or the, the, the timber that comes in there comes in on the trailer pulled by a pickup truck. It's not, it's not, I can't stress enough the minuscule level of production as compared to what you would expect to see out of a sawmill. So <clears throat> I have to go, you know, and because of its limited production, when we first received this letter and I first started researching it, from, from day one, the planning has tried to shove us into this section, commercial ag related, um, section 40, 557, no, 4559, commercial ag related. And it talks, that's the only place. Now, if you get in the land development code, the only use category in all of the use categories, the only use category where you're going to see the word sawmill is in commercial ag related. So they recognize that it's an agricultural thing, but they, but that use category is not allowed. If you look through the um, uses by zoning district, the next section that they have to put in, the only place that that category is allowed is in agricultural zoning. So the zoning is trying to paint this with a wide stroke brush. They're trying to put anything that you can label sawmill into a classification that bears industrial level concerns. And that's not what this, that's absolutely not what this is. We have contended from day one that it should not be a commercial ag related use category. It should fall under 4557, Ag General. And under that, Ag General says, Agriculture General states, agricultural uses are those related to the production, keeping, or maintenance, whether for sale or personal use of plants or animals, for food, forage, fiber, or ornamental purposes. Now, lumber is fiber, and the a lot of the, the bulk of the production of what Mr. Buckles does coming out of there is decorative corral board fence and tongue and groove wall, wall coverings or siding, however you want to label it. Both of which are decorative, both of which meet the word for word definition of ag general. Now, had zoning taken an understanding of our point of view, realized in 4557 that we meet the word for word definition of what they're trying to put in Act General, then they would have accepted the use and a, and a special use permit would not have been allowed or would not have been required rather. But we couldn't come to an agreement. Zoning, zoning held to their guns that they're gonna to try to shove it in this hole in commercial ag related. When the whole time we were saying, it's Ag General, it doesn't need a special use permit. So to facilitate compliance, here we are $750 later, standing in front of you guys trying to determine where this thing's going to go. So let's say, let's, let me back up one second and say that in that, in that, that pigeonhole of sawmill, there's a caveat in there that says when the wood comes from the, from it, from the site where the saw is lo located, meaning it only can be cut off the four and a half acres where the saw that's not the case with any other sawmill in town. The two industrial level sawmills that we have that are zoned ag, that both operate with multiple semi trucks of wood coming in and out, don't have one stitch of wood cut on the property or the adjacent property. And when I, and when I brought forth the argument, hey, look, Mr. Buckles owns more property than just where the saw is. He owns 10 acres down the road that's timbered. Can we bring, saw, can we bring logs from there to his mill? His, for his use, his mill, his, his property, Although it was not adjacent, they said, no, you cannot do that. It has to come from the site. They were taking a literal word for word of what the thing said. So if we're going to go by word for word, our contention has been you can go to Ag General and fit word for word definition and not have to have a special use permit. But again, here we are, $750 later. Um, so 
the direction would be, what if I were to say, I wanted to set up a sawmill knowing that I was not going to bring a small-scale sawmill, not an not a industrial level saw, something from basically for my own personal use, barter and trade, some of the material. If I were going to set that up, if I were going to set that up and I came into the building department, or the zoning rather, and I specifically said I'm not cutting the wood on my property. Any other variation from that requires that you make an interpretation of how it's going to be used. So it doesn't fit the slot of commercial ag related because the trees aren't coming from there. So how are we going to apply it? Well, if you're not going to accept the fact that we believe it's ag general, then we have to find another path to compliance. Well, the path to compliance, I believe, if we, if we choose that, if we say yes, we're willing to accept that it, it, it's going to take a special use permit in some form or fashion, then the path to compliance becomes going to um, Ordinance 2002 06, which is the adoption of the Land Development Code. And in Section 2 of that, on the first page of that, it says, where a term is not defined within the context of these articles, the Land Development Code, the definitions provided in the Zoning Ordinance 88-1 or elsewhere in existing ordinance shall apply. So the fact that it doesn't fit into the, uh, the context of sawmill where trees are grown from the other land, that, and it's not specifically defined anywhere else in the Land Development Code, means we need to revert to Ordinance 88-1, which is the original, you guys know this, this is the original Land Development Code that was adopted in 1988. <clears throat> And in that, in the original 88-1, it make, it says that in an agricultural zoning, a sawmill, without the caveat of the trees coming from, it just says sawmill, is accepted in agricultural products or ag agricultural zoning provided it has a special use permit. So if we are going to come to common ground, you're not, you, their zoning is not going to accept my, my understanding as it's general ag and I'm not going to take theirs that it's a sawmill coming with, where we're cutting only the trees from the property, then the, the middle ground, the path to compliance, is going through 88-1, in which case there's no caveat for trees from elsewhere. Now, with that being said, it's obvious that planning does not understand the limited scope of what goes on out there, how, how little it's used. It may be used once a week. It might not be used in a week. The, the logs aren't coming in and out. Of it. There's not a delivery. Mr. Buckles does not have employees. When he works out, he works by himself. If you see anybody else out there working, it's friends of his helping it that he's probably providing wood to them. Like, that's, that's how he operates. The wood that he uses out there, I have a prime example. Pinal Baptist Church had four trees taken down. Um, where they were installing a new modular building. The arborist came in and said it's going to be such and such many dollars for us to take the trees down, and it's going to be a dramatic amount more if we have to move the trees, if we have to haul the big wood off from there. They called Mr. Buckles and said, we've got four trees down here. Would you, what would you charge us to move? He said, I won't charge you anything. I'll show up there and pick them up. He brought his equipment onto the site to pick up four, four pine trees, load them on a trailer and haul them off for free, free of charge. And that's not uncommon. That's very common for what he does. He's basically taking what is refuse off of other jobs, turning them into something that we can use. So it's obvious that staff doesn't understand the minimum uh, production of what's going there. So much so, we understand the buffering issue. We understand that you want to keep it hidden from there. But they keep making a point about noise. Well, and to the point where they've, they've, they've brought up buffering and they've brought up enclosing the sawmill in a building. Now, that shows a lack of understanding of how the sawmill works. The, the, the bandsaw, you pick a log up with a, fork, with a tractor with a set of forks on it and you place the log on the bandsaw. It saws it into whatever you're going to saw it and you offload it with a, with a tractor with forks on it. That would require a 10,000 square foot building and we're going to all die of carbon monoxide in the building because the tractor's not made to be inside the building. So that, that right there shows me that they do not understand the production of what's going on there. And the enclosure thing wasn't required on the either of the other two sawmills who are industrial level sawmills. So <clears throat> the 
biggest thing that I can stress is I don't want us to jam every, just because we can put the name sawmill on it does me, not mean we need to paint everything with one brush. So, you know, to just to summarize this all up, we are, we are here to facilitate, we are here for, to facilitate compliance. We disagree with, the, with, with, with how they've tried to put it in a hole. We, we believe it should be ag general and not required a special use permit. But if we're going to go through 88.1, we don't mind acknowledging we need a special use permit. However, we would prefer that you guys not take the recommendations of enclosure and logs coming from somewhere else because 88-1 specifically leaves us the ability to have a mill in an agricultural zoning um, without that restriction of, of log origin uh, and without the restriction, the restriction of the enclosure. Um, as far as I know, Mr. Buckles, with the exception of maybe one or two neighbors, um, has a good working relationship with everybody there. Um, again, the mill's run by a lawnmower engine. It's nothing more dramatic than that. Um, it's, it really is, uh, it really is a small scope project what he's got going out there. And again, it's been in, it's been in, it's been there for a long time. It's the fact that somebody's making an issue about it now just shows how off the radar it is to the point where when when codes enforcement when I talked to uh, uh, Tom from codes enforcement who actually wrote the original thing up he said I had no idea it was out he said until I got to the back of the property I didn't know anything was even there so that's how that's how hidden from public view it is so I think uh, uh, Mr. Buckles is willing to willing to do whatever he needs to do to make compliance but I think I think we are uh, trying to institute a lot of things that, that don't necessarily be, need to be put on him. So with that, I'll take any questions that you guys have or. <clears throat> well, Tech, I am not a sawmill person, but I, you made a statement and I have a question for you. It said that you did corral boards and tongue and groove. So That's how right. do you do tongue and groove with just a bandsaw? He does tongue and groove with the bandsaw, and then he has a he has a planer in the in the um, one of those enclosed containers out there. Oh, okay, so so it's, it's not one process on the bandsaw. It, I understand. No, I know that. You, you can't, know what I mean? Yeah, that's, so there's a. I mean, I, I'm not saying the, band, the the bandsaw is the only piece of equipment on site, but I'm saying that the product. So one of the caveats in the in the uh, definition of sawmill was something that didn't produce finished wood. So and they they excluded out. Um, like furniture places and stuff that actually take raw wood and turn it into something. And I didn't want to like bring that argument forward to, but I, I, I believe that that is absolutely a piece of this puzzle. He's taking, he's not just producing lumber as you would expect a sawmill to, he's producing a finished product and the bandsaw that he uses is just one piece in that puzzle. It's not, it's not a, it's not a commercial business that's built around the saw as a sawmill. It's a, it's a, family owned small time farm type operation where he produces a finished product that is not lumber it's it's decorative board so and I, and again i think that fits in ag general all the <coughs> way i think that fits 100% into the definition of of the use category of ag general now we've had a big we've had several disagreements on that but i i from our view that is exactly what what's happening here so okay any other questions from mr morris Okay, thank okay. you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to come forward and speak in favor of this application? Anyone wishing to come forward and speak in opposition? Okay, I'm sorry. Are you speaking in favor? Are you speaking in opposition? Okay. If you're speaking in opposition, you may come forward at this time. Please state your name and address for the record. My name is Santa McDaniel. I live at 1281 South State Road 19, right next door to the Jason Land. Okay. All right. Uh, just from what I heard from uh, this lady and what Would the gentleman just said. Could you speak up a little bit I'm more? I'm sorry. Okay. Can you hear me this thing? Yes, okay. sir. Uh, from what I just heard from uh, that lady and the gentleman just right now, everything, there's also a few other things to consider besides just what he said as far as a uh, bandsaw. The bandsaw 
I've never been up close to it. Note that this is a circular round blade or an actual bandsaw and everything, but it's as large as that whole piece of desk y'all sitting in front of and probably a little bit higher and stuff like that. And a truck would not just pull that. It need to be a fifth wheel or a gooseneck uh, dually or anything to move the stuff. So it's not just something you just get at Lowe's or buy offline and everything. As a bandsaw, you would have in your backyard cutting up a little bit of lumber. And the trees out there that have been stored closer to my house, which is farther up from the sawmill itself, is uh, at least half the size of that diameter as far as round and half to three quarters the length and everything. So that's not just something you just, you know, call it, pull up with a truck or a small trailer and everything. When I say uh, a trailer and everything, I was out there when it was most of that wood was delivered and stuff and brought onto the property and everything. And it was dumped by this huge black uh, trailer on the back of a truck that had a you know tilt bed dumped the lint. It, so much lumber was dumped out there just in that one little fall and everything that literally shook the ground, shaking the windows in my house. My wife screaming in the middle of the uh, morning and everything, going, "What's happening? What's happening?" And I'm like, "The next door neighbor's dropping off some lumber. Just something that happens and everything." And I understand this man; he uses this to. Uh, make some money sometimes sometimes he uses it to uh, give to ch charity to help other people out and everything that's great but the point is us neighbors they live right there and everything we have to take the blunt of that not just the sawmill in the back which we can hear very loudly in a 25 horse or not it's a screaming blade that makes a lot of noise cutting that wood and everything so and all the other stuff as far as the equipment which is an artic articulating loader and everything and another piece of uh, tractor I believe a forklift and everything that comes out and moves the lumber and moves the logs back and forth and everything from right there beside my house all the way to the back and then back again and everything. So when he does do it, whether it be on every weekend or every other weekend and everything like that, or it's usually first thing in the morning, crack of dawn, a little bit later and everything. So that wakes me up in the morning and everything, which I have to go to work in Jacksonville and I've got to leave sometimes, you know, that time right there. Sometimes I got to leave at three o'clock in the afternoon so I didn't get no sleep and I've got to listen to that most of the day. The point is, is I'm trying to make is, uh, it's not just located in the back and everything. It's that whole piece of land up there all the way to the houses. I believe you just said there's a house to the right and left. I want to own the one to the left. And when the trees are dropped off there, it makes a thunderous sound from the heavy equipment and stuff being dropped off in that piece of land and then pushed all the way up to right there next to my piece of property that I've got to look at these lumber, you know, which is not, you know, incredibly bad or anything, but the point is I got to look at, you know, giant stacks of lumber beside my house, you know, for six months till they dry out till he cuts them and gets rid of them and everything. And the lumber that he brings on and everything is donated from other people and stuff like that, which is uh, basically, uh, you know, money in his pocket because he didn't have to pay for it. So it's free wood that he gets and has to use to cut and, and sell if he wants to sell it or give it away, whatever it place to be. But the point I'm trying to make is everything, it's not just right there at the very back, which is not enclosed and everything, which I don't know if that's got to be fully enclosed, which I understand that, it, just like the man said and everything, it's, it's illogical to have a small building that he's got to have room enough to put the wood in and everything like that, or uh, he'd have to have a 10,000 square foot building and everything, which that's going to take a lot of you know, money, time and everything. But uh, the fence line that, I, that separates our property and everything is... I, I haven't even cut the trees because of this, because I'd love to cut it and see my fence again and everything, but when the trucks and, tra and trucks and woods out there are being dumped off and everything like that, it blocks a little bit of sound, but not enough. And between the sawmill and this right here and him working every weekend, which he has not worked every weekend because I think this right here came up, it's uh, been a real headache for the rest of us to live around and everything because it was, at one time, literally every weekend. And every weekend is the only time I have off. So I got to listen to a sawmill run every, every weekend. So I don't know how about y'all and everything, but I'm sure y'all would like a little quiet time, y'all's little homestead too. So I don't, do not think that this uh, uh, special permit should be uh, allowed. And uh, if there's any other questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Well, I think if uh, he's restricted from bringing anything in on his property anymore, that you know anybody coming in and dumping logs would be resolved. Um, that's if. That's, you know, we'll, we'll see. So. I mean, if I got a sawmill, I'm going to want to make some money in it being out there. I'm going to, you know, bring wood in. And it, I, like I said, I live right next door. It doesn't have that many trees. 
I mean, maybe, maybe a week's worth of cut and two weeks worth of cut and he, he's out. But so that wood, like the man, like the gentleman said, owns 10 acres down the road, I'd want to bring that wood in and cut it. And if I had a sawmill that size and everything, being and it is a, it's a little bit of a monster and everything. It's been out there for a long time and I understand it's you know an antique. So it ain't no little quiet little uh, Kohler running in. <laughs> it, it makes a noise. So I'd want Adam to Chair. use it to, okay. to its full efficiency. Second. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, thank you. I have a question of yeah. Oh, yo, you have a question of Mr. Yes, McDaniels? Okay. How long have you been there? I've been there six and a half years. Six and a half years, so you knew that you knew the mill was there when you went no, there. No, I didn't actually. You we, did not. we bought the house and everything. We didn't see it until I think three days after we signed the papers because, like I said, the trees were up by the fence and everything like that. And as me and my wife were walking the property and everything, looking at, oh, we was looking at the house, of course, more important than anything. We looked at the property. She wanted to put some horses out there. She said, what is that? And I looked at her and I said, I think that's a sawmill. I said, it's a big one too. And uh, she said, well, what do you mean it's a sawmill? I said, well, it's one of the uh, ones you can pull on your property and cut lumber with and everything. She said, what do you mean by lumber? I said, you know, lumber, you know, two by fours, four by eight, six by sixes, you know, big lumber. So you didn't do due, due diligence around where you were buying it? Like I said, we were living in Jacksonville at the time and everything, and I did not inspect the full property land and everything like that, and it was pushed over to the back, and that's where he was first starting to cut. We didn't even know it ran, because okay. like I said, it looked so old, until like the first two weeks we were there, and then Saturday morning we woke up to a sawmill running next to us. Okay. The, the sawmill, the statement was the sawmill's been there for 40 years? 20. 20, okay. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, Mr. Uh, Morris, you want to have a rebuttal on that? I have a question for him, too, when okay. he gets second. Oh, you had another question? I have a question for him when he gets done. At the, uh, at the time that he purchased the property there to the north, that sawmill was on the front half of the property. It was operating up there probably 150 yards closer to his house than where it's currently positioned. When he purchased that property, Shortly thereafter, Mr. Buckles moved the mill to the back of the property. And again, what he's what he's calling there um, uh, a load, a delivery of logs. I I, I, I mentioned in my in my statement that Mr. Buckles did take a large load of logs, being helpful to somebody. So if there's a if you guys want to restrict the number of logs coming in, or the amount of logs that can be on it. I mean, I do, that may be an option there too. But but it was an isolated incident. What uh, the neighbors referring to versus what is consistent with normal use there. So, like I said, that 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 <clears throat> that bandsaw was dramatic a dramatic amount closer to his home prior to him purchasing and when he purchased it, and consequently, you know, from 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 that house being purchased from from the Mullises, I believe he got it from David and Dean Mullis. Um, after he purchased that, being a good neighbor. Frank moved the moved the mill to the back so as to not disturb him. So it's not he's he, Mr. Buckles is not over there without consideration to the neighbors. He takes his he takes the neighbors pretty seriously. So um, you know a lot of times most most time a, a simple phone call clears a lot of that stuff up. This is I think this is where our, the codes case originated from uh, the call for that got this whole ball rolling. So okay, you just you mentioned something about bringing logs in. Well, according to this, he can't bring logs in anymore. That, that, and that's all, our whole point of contention. Number one, we shouldn't be here for a special use permit. Number two, well, according, we're here today. I know, so. No, no, I understand that. <laughs> I, I understand that. Um, but but, but this, uh, is, we're but here today. However, if if this board recognized that that bandsaw, from the way we've described it and what actually happens there, is under the understanding that falls under Act General, even though you guys issue that special use permit, it's not. It would, if you were to say it belongs to Ag General, that 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 SUP is not needed. I mean, that that's the solution. Well, for, that's from, not you know, that's the easiest solution for us. But we understand that that's not going to happen. But Madam uh, Chair, if I may address that, if, yes, sir. If I was going to ask you to okay. chime in. Um, just to address a few points, um, th this is this is a method uh, for compliance for them. There is no other method of compliance. Um, going back to a previous code that's not in force anymore is not an option here. Um, the, the point about there is no path forward for a sawmill that brings logs on site, there is a path forward. It's in an, in an industrial zone, it's considered a heavy industrial use. 
in the land development code. Um, the point about the sawmill having been there for the last 20 years, we pulled aerial imagery going back to 2005 and 2008, and I don't see any buildings out there or any structures that would appear to- The structures weren't there. Hang on just a second. Yep. That would appear to show any kind of presence of a sawmill. Um, the, so the, the point about uh, the properties to the north and south not being residential, they certainly are residential. They have residences on there. So an agricultural district that has a, a single family residence on there is considered a residential property. Um, and I think that addresses most of the points that I, you know, we, we've tried to, to explain to the applicant that this is the only point forward, but the idea that there's some other path forward is just not possible um, under the current code. Okay. May I ask staff sure. a question? Um, with, um, you're saying that if it's a residential property, if a residential home is on an agricultural zone property, is considered residential? Yes, sir. Is it taxed in that way too? Yes, sir. It is? Yes. Yes, so okay. the property appraiser looks at whether there's a single family residence on there, and I don't know if, I don't know exactly how they tax it, but I do know that there's a residential classification. I do know how they tax it. Property. They tax out the portion, the portion that is residential, they tax it, the acre or whatever. That's only they, if it's green belt. And then, that's and then not, they, they that, cut it into pieces that is not, or whatever. That, that's false. That is not, that's, if it's green belted, then they will well. exempt the portion that's green belted. But if it's not green belted, then the property uh, is taxed residentially. Mr. Fisher, did you have a question? I answered my question. Oh, you answered your question. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is somebody in the back? Uh, the gentleman in the back that has his hand up, did you, were you sworn in? Yes. Okay. You're going to speak in opposition? Okay. Will you come <laughs> forward? <coughs> Please state your name and address for the record. My name is Dr. Neil Benson. I live at 127 Karen Court in Hermitage Shores. <clears throat> and um, I'm not sure entirely whether I'm going to speak in opposition or support today. Uh, perhaps a little bit of both. Uh, likely will display my ignorance because I'm not familiar with this type of proceedings. If you talk to me about medicine, I know quite a bit about that, but I don't know much about government proceedings. I can say that I've known Frank Buckles for over 25 years. Um, I know that he came about this parcel of land as it was deeded to him by his grandmother Lillian, who I knew as well. Uh, we have been, uh, I believe that uh, Lillian told me that her purpose in deeding it to Frank was so that he could build his home on it. It's also my understanding that he moved in the um, the sawmill, as it were, in order to mill his own wood in order to build his own home on that property that was deeded to him by his grandmother. Um, he actually retrieved a log from my front yard after a 80-foot oak tree fell on my house in 2008 and took it to his property to mill the 20 foot uh, long trunk that was about three feet in diameter. <clears throat> I have a concern because I can hear that saw when I'm sitting on my back patio. It's about 300, maybe 400 feet 
from my backyard. And my concern has been, ever since I received this invitation, is, is this going to turn into a commercial enterprise? And is that saw going to be running 24-7? Because most industrial sawmills run almost around the clock, seven days a week. What I've heard today does not sound like that is the plan. It sounds as though there is going to be intermittent use of a limited nature for short periods of time. And the sound is annoying, but it's for short periods of time. It's not 24-7. Um, I, I think that speaks in favor of Frank's position. My question would be, if this special use, use permit is granted, would that potentially open a door to change from what it is now to perhaps move in a more commercial, industrial direction? And I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I would have to depend on you folks for the answer to that. Um, so, as, I'm, as I already said, I don't know whether I'm speaking for or against. Um, I am very much in favor of Frank Buckles. Uh, I have cared for three generations of his family. I've known him uh, most of his adult life. Uh, I regard him as a good neighbor, and I would never want to do anything to hurt him. I'm not too keen on having a sawmill 24-7 in my backyard. So if that means I'm for, okay. If it means I'm against, okay. I'm well, sort of in the middle, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Let me just tell you that this board does have the, um, they can put a limited hours of operation if that is, if they so choose as a condition. Yes, ma'am. and. Uh, I guess uh, my follow-up question would, to that would be, um, who enforces that? That's a good question. We'll ask staff. <laughs> so any conditions of appro approval, Madam Chair, would be enforced by the Development Services Department. Um, uh, so I would caution that with hours of operation, um, if the, if the condition on hours of operation is outside of the normal operating hours of the code enforcement department, it will be difficult to, um, to enforce that um, unless we receive a complaint that has some sort of proof of conducting the, the enterprise or the, the operation outside of those hours. Okay, what, what are considered the hours within operation? Eight to, eight to four, eight to five? Right now, we have not imposed a condition or recommended a condition. I understand that, but uh, you said, okay. So, oh, you mean for the department? I'm sorry, uh, 830 to 830 5. to 5. Okay, so if anything is outside of that, then if anybody calls and complains, and if it's ceased when you are there, then there's nothing you can do about it. Is that right. correct? Okay. Unless we have some sort of proof okay. that would show that they were operating out, five outside. Five days a week? Uh, yes, sir. Monday through Friday? or Yes, sir. And also, I think the question, will this special use permit roll over to a commercial or industrial use? Uh, not as recommended uh, by staff. So if the five conditions are imposed, it will remain a small operation. Um, and on the, so the, the, there was a point brought up about noise uh, one of the reasons that staff had recommended that it be within an enclosed building is because the entire time that we have spoken to the applicant, we have been led to believe that this was a very small operation, not any large machinery that could not be enclosed within a building, but staff would still stand by that recommendation.
to, to help mitigate the noise uh, because otherwise there is no mitigation of the noise unless they put up a six or eight foot concrete block wall all around the property. Dr. Benson, does that answer your question? Sort of cited? Yes, sort of thank you. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions for Dr. Benson? Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Anyone else wishing to come forward and speak? Okay. Madam yes. Chair, um, I just would like to share. I don't know. We did receive two um, emails. I believe all of you have them from two uh, citizens. Yes. Uh, one was pro, one was con. Um, you have them, I believe, either in your packet or on at your yeah, station right now. Are you going to put those as part of the record? They will. They are part of the record and will continue okay. to be part of the record. All right. Mm -hmm. and anything else? Okay. At this time, the will be the meeting will be closed to the public and open it up for a board motion and discussion. I have some questions. Okay, we have some questions <laughs> before we decide to make a motion. If we were to approve this, can we put some sort of condition in there to limit the size of this so it can never go commercial? Uh, so currently, the, the the conditions as proposed and even the use listed under the special uses under the agriculture zoning district would never permit it to go commercially or grow to a size that's commercial. If you wanted to, um, let's see here. If you wanted to impose a condition that states that no additional structures be added to what is already there, um, then that could limit any additional structures from be being brought on the site associated with the sawmill. Um, but as it's written now, and as staff has recommended, this will not be allowed to grow into a commercial enterprise. Uh, my thoughts were that if we limit him to sowing timber harvested off of his property, there's not that much property out there. That, that's almost going to go down. In a, he could probably get rid of all the wood out there in a week. But then when I was there, I mean, he's got some big logs out there. We don't need logs that big out there either. Right. So this, um, the, the way the code is written and the way our condition is written, uh, the applicant would not be, or the owner would not be able to bring any additional logs on the site. So the only option for continuing the operation would be to replant the site and use anything that's grown on site. And that's the way the land development code is written. We just reiterated it in the, um, in the uh, conditions. Let, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Perry your question, yes, our attorney. Uh, if and ever he ever decided to go commercial or industrial, that would be would have to be rezoned to be able to do that. Am I correct, or? Ma'am, that, that's a that's another question for our staff, and I think that they can address that better than I can. Oh, okay. So I mean, Gabriel, yes, Madam Chair. Ever decided would he have to rezone that piece of property to go? commercial or industrial? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, okay. she, uh, the, the owner would have to rezone to industrial heavy, um, which would not be compatible with the site. Uh, the staff would definitely recommend a denial. I mean, you know, that's always an avenue, though. Right. Uh, the, the applicant or the owner could try. Right. Okay. Madam Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, I take issue with the fact that we're trying to force a man to build a 10,000 square foot building around the property and around equipment that's been there for 20 years. We're trying to tell a man how to use his property. I mean, I know that's what, that, what zoning is all about and things like that, but these, these things are there and have been there 20 years, whether you saw them on site, you know, on an aerial visual or not, most of the equipment's been there. The equipment, but not the building. Is that what you're saying? I'm just saying the equipment's been there. But there's no building, I mean, you know, there now. Staff could find no proof of that. Okay, uh, and I understand that. I'm, I'm saying you saw no aerial view or anything like right, that. Right, but the, the applicant but, couldn't produce any but proof of it. In, in saying but, 
Are you not saying in what you're asking here for him to build a building now? That would be correct. But see, the, the reason that staff had proposed that is because the applicant has contended th this entire time that this is a very small operation for personal products so or for family products. Never that um, there would be, uh, you know, a, a large operation there. It, it, it never... It was never portrayed to us. Well, like when you that. say family products, um, meaning for his own family. Uh, well, again, when you say own family, are you talking about his personal family, right? His kids, his wife, and things like that. Meaning or not just, for profit. Okay, I'm, I'm with you. Okay. Let me finish my question. Sorry. Do you realize how big Mr. Buckle's family is? I fully understand, sir. But the 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 issue here is not whether he can produce the products on site. The issue here is that. The applicant posed to staff something that was not represented the same way in this meeting. And, then, and I'm going back to the 10,000 square foot building. I mean, how do we make a man build a 10,000 square foot building on his property? Madam Chair, I, the, the, if I may, I'm not sure of where the 10,000 square foot That's been building came right from. Here. That's from the applicant. I, I, I don't know where, how that became a... a, a um, a solidified requirement, but he would have to enclose it. Yeah, that's correct, but not a ten. The whole sawmill. Yes, sir. Not just a bandsaw. So the 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 operation of the sawmill would have to be enclosed, or, or um, if this board proposes another condition that would mitigate the noise better, but that was staff's uh, only way of mitigating the noise in an economically feasible way for the applicant as opposed to building a, a large wall that would mitigate the noise. Yes, sir, Mr. Fisher. I can't see anything. If it's only four acres, how, I mean, it lasts a week and then he's done anyway. So, I mean, unless they could change that, him bringing in wood from outside, I think he's just kind of SOL. Excuse my language, but and that's what I'm getting at. You're, you're shoving it right down his throat. Um, is there any? Is, I'm sorry. Is there any way of letting him bring in a small amount of? No, sir. The way the code is written right now, without a code change, we could not allow it. And uh, I. Mr. Marsh, I think you have to. So there's there's. Excuse, excuse me. me. We're, we're discussing. We'll. No, no, excuse me. We are in a discussion. So the way that thank the you. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, the way that the code is written right now, um, we could not permit it, and we would never recommend approval of that either, just because of My the question proximity. also would be who's going to regulate it? Who's going to say, oh, you can only bring in two logs a day, Correct. or you can bring in two logs this week? Who's going to be out there to say, oh, you brought in four? So, you know, it, it's, it's regulation also. So, uh, you know, sometimes good intentions and then we decide oh well this is just one time we'll do this so unless there's no but there's somebody out there on a day-to-day -day basis to enforce it there's no way to there's no way to regulate it or enforce I it know, but it's if it passes or doesn't pass he's just right closing up shop pretty much well you know madam chair i'd like to just weigh in briefly okay. um just to remind the the board members i think that uh Keep your, uh, let everybody keep in mind that, that what our staff is doing is interpreting the code. They're, they're not adding to it or taking from it. They're trying to tell you what the status of the law is in uh, Putnam County. I don't think they're trying to force anything down anybody's throat or make anybody do anything that they do not think is supported by the Land Development Code. I would also... Um, uh, remind our board members that, that when you decide this issue, that you must decide it on the basis of, sust of sub substantial and competent evidence. And that's all I have, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. When I'm directing this at staff, it's just staff. It's not personal. Oh. I'm just, I just want him to understand that. I'm just, I'm just, I'm looking at him because he happens to be. Sitting over there. He happens to be in that chair. <laughs> okay, so this is nothing personal. I'm just, you know, I'm just stating my view. Well, 
vote in if they're not going to deliver? Would he like to say something else before we vote? Do what? I said, would he like to say something else before we vote? Are we going to give, since I've already closed the meeting to the public, uh, is it, can I, as procedure, it's okay to have Mr. Morris come back up here? Or do we stick to Parliament Robert's Rules of Order? Madam Chair, I'm not sure what Robert's Rules of Order <laughs> actually would say says on this. in this, but I know this, that you are the chair of the, uh, of the uh, okay. commission, and if one of our members has questions or there's other questions for the board, you certainly have the power to reopen uh, discussion. Okay. All right, Mr. Morris, I will allow you to come forward and say what you have to say that's sort of not already been said. Would you please? I mean, I, okay. So okay, please, please identify yourself again. Okay, Justin Morris, one eight zero Stokes Landing Road. Um, the uh, Gabriel made a, made a comment a few minutes ago about you cannot use an old zoning regulation, which is absolutely incorrect. Now the, the, we're doing two things here. We are both reading the same codes. We both have a level of professionalism and a level of experience in these codes, and we are interpreting. He is interpreting the way he wants to interpret it, however he sees fit, and I, I, I understand that. But I have just as much experience understanding codes and ordinances as they were written. Now, you can give a section of code very often to multiple people and come up with completely different interpretations. Now, Gabriel said that you cannot revert to the old code when in fact the first page of the adoption of the current land development code says when you have an issue that's not resolved, you can refer to 88.1. So if you're talking about not using 88.1 because it's an old code, then it, that's absolutely incorrect because you can, from the front page of the ordinance, refer to 88.1 to solve problems, which is exactly the problem we're having here. What we're, the problem we're having here is the new land development code calls out a sawmill where the trees come from its own property as one, one piece, or anything beyond that has to be an interpretation. He's gonna say it's heavy industrial, to be considered light industrial through a reading too. I could interpret a couple of different ways. It could be determined to be ag general. It could go in two or three use categories depending on who is interpreting the code. I understand it's his recommendation to y'all, but if you guys are only gonna take his interpretation of the code without, without taking into the ability of a, a path to compliance through the code that I just cited, if you guys are not gonna pay attention to that and you're only gonna take his word, then, then there was no sense for us coming here because the recommendations from staff are gonna be the things that are imposed. We are asking you guys for a unbiased opinion and take it upon yourselves to interpret this code, not just regurgitate what's coming from planning because we understand their position. We've understood their position from day one. We have never in the, in, we have never in the course of this action you have already sort of stated that, so is there uh, something else that's yes, going to be different? Yes, ma'am. We have never in the he, he, he accused of, of, of misleading or lying about enclosing. But he has correlated us saying that it's a small operation into somehow we were implying that we were going to enclose the building. We have never, in the course of this whole operation, mentioned or alluded to that. Not one time. That, that, that is pure falsehood, and it, it, it feels personal from us. From that side of the from that side of the, of the desk, we understand you guys got a lot of stuff to do and you should remain impartial and it shouldn't be emotional. But when you guys send out a letter where it's written from zoning and it has highlighted in red and it has a bunch of stuff, a bunch of code references and stuff in there that make people feel they're guilty, it takes an emotional, it, it is emotionally taxing, especially to the property owner on a fight that very often the public feels is a losing battle. And if you guys won't take it on yourself to interpret the sections of code that I'm citing, and I don't care if we have, if you guys table this till the next discussion, I would prefer that you guys read the sections of codes that I just cited with an unbiased view of it. Right now, y'all are taking the opinion that that is fact, and what I'm saying is uh, up here is skeptical. What I'm telling you is I have read the same code books and the same ordinance that he has, and I have come up to a decision that what Mr. Buckles is doing 
can very easily be interpreted into a different use category without the restrictions that are trying to be imposed here. So saying that we're trying to mislead and all that is not, is not correct. And that's, it's in y'all's hand, but we would appreciate an unbiased opinion. Well, may I make a statement? Yes, ma'am. This is totally a volunteer board. No, I understand we that. We are not paid. Uh, we, are, you know, we have no uh, input as to their decisions or anything. So we are totally volunteer. We are all citizens of Putnam County. I understood that. I, I sat on the uh, Construction Trades Board and did the same thing that you guys are doing. But what I do know is that when, when the agenda comes before you and you guys see the cases that are here, your first call is not to me or the homeowner to find out what the problem no, is. Your not, call not, is to staff to find out the history. Huh? We are not going to call you. No, I know, that. and that's that's my point. Okay. But you can talk to staff. So, for the the so fact we haven't. That, well, I haven't. Well, but you have the option to. So, to prevent there from being any misplaced communication, it should you guys shouldn't be talking to staff before this problem too. There, this should be in effect a a a, a judgment on the facts based <coughs> on what you guys hear today, not researching their position, assuming that it's right, and then just listen to me blabber on and then siding with what their findings were. Because that's not, I just laid out a, co a, a path to compliance, word for word, right out of the land development code and the ordinances. Okay. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying, I don't want to be combative up here and I don't want to, and I, it's just, it's an emotional topic. And we have been working, I have lost sleep and it's not even my property over how this is handled because we started off with uh, Gabriel's predecessor here, and I thought we were to a point where he was going to back a special use permit with not a bunch of extracurricular stuff in it. He was under, uh, uh, Truliano or whatever his name was, was under the understanding. He knew the limited function of this, and then he left. And so when Gabriel took it over, it, enclosure and the, um, and the buffer came in after our meeting without us ever being aware, we were not aware that those two requirements were coming until we received the letter of what staff recommendation was gonna be. And we've had multiple meetings with zoning before this happened and came to an agreement trying to work this out. And then we had multiple, we had multiple things get thrown in on us. So to, to flat out act like we're being untruthful about it is not correct. We have been forthcoming and tried, tried to get compliance. Our problem is we just differ about how the interpretation of the code goes okay. so like i said we'd appreciate you guys to look at it through an untainted lens thank you sir thank you and thank you for letting me come back to speak madam chairman um is can i address that go ahead gabriel um when you start talking about enclosing a building uh or in, in a building enclosement i mean you're talking about roof structures and all right is that what you're saying or a cement wall around the, the property i mean i think that would uh fit in with the the intent um of that that condition a wall around the immediate um uh, a wall How about six foot wood privacy that's where i was going a, a privacy and, fence and, would not and but she's gonna get on to you um that's where i was going with the you know like a six foot privacy fence around it maybe not around it but maybe two towards this gentleman's home or towards the other gentleman there, there's got to be a medium that we can reach agree it doesn't cost mr buckles a lot of money so something that would mitigate noise much like a building's wall would but a six foot privacy fence would not mitigate noise very much at all um how about i mean a six foot privacy fence and and some kind of buffering um vegetation well so that that's required um, that would be required in the type A buffer, one or the other, but then uh, perhaps to fulfill the, the intent of that condition uh, number four, um, if this board wishes to alter that to simply state um, a sound mitigating um, barrier such as a concrete wall or um, a some sort of thing is it, it what, what I don't want to do is is uh, um, recommend that something unsafe be built out there and I'm not and I'm not recommending that at all but you know me being a poor old country boy I know that when you get into you're starting to do things like this that um, the more money you 
somebody puts on you, requiring you to do things that you've been doing for a number of years already under another code, and now you've got this code that's telling you you're wrong. Again, how just are we to be doing that to this person? So, and I would agree with you on that point. However, this code has been in place since 2003, and staff, again, could not find any okay. evidence of, of there being a, a sawmill operation prior to 2003. So, um, if, give me just a moment, I'll, I'll try to think of some wording here. Um, I would recommend simply, if, you're, if the board is not content with the wording of number four, then simply stating that I don't have a, um, a soundproofing barrier be installed um, and then suggest certain barriers enclosing the area. Well, that's what I'm saying. If we can suggest some kind of barrier. Um, right, so, um, so number four could be altered to state that and then provide some suggestions um, that would be inclusive of what the board would want. Okay, because um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, I want, I want you to understand, I'm not trying to say anything when I asked you how long you had been here. I'm not trying to say, you know, you're, you're, you've only been here six years. I just, you know, I'm trying to find a medium, a happy medium between what's going on here. And there has to be that. I mean, you know, we, I mean, as, as neighbors, we have to do that with each other. But I would also like to m make mention that I think had we actually seen the operation itself, because when I went down there, the gate was closed. No way was I going to open that gate and walk down or drive down to see the building. So it was not accessible to us or to me in any today. So I don't know if anybody else got to drive down to see the building or you went to the gate and you stopped. So I could see something that looked like green uh, metal on, far, on farther down but you could not see the, the actual operation. So I think in, in instances where there is some contention that the, the owner or whoever the applicant is should make the site visits for us a little more approachable that we can actually see what's going on. So we're all, you know, the, the building could have been halfway up or, you know, sides or whatever, I don't know. So, um, and then there's also the issue with the noise well, and, and so there, let, let, let me just add, Madam Chair, if I may, that these buildings right now, one of the reasons this has to go through the development review process is because some of these buildings are not permitted right now. Once they're permitted, they may have to be moved slightly to uh, meet setbacks. So um, putting a more general condition is what I rec recommend rather than putting in something very that, that's very specific to the site because they may still have to be moved. I mean, it still has to go through the development uh, um, yes, review committee. Correct. Okay. After, if this is approved. If, the, if this is approved, correct. Can I? Mr. I'm sorry, Madam Gordon. Chairman. Madam Chairman, can I make a motion that we table this until there, we have, uh, hmm, What's the word? Yeah, there you go. More clarity in the situation. We can make a motion. Uh, I don't know if the applicant is willing He's to. Already mentioned he would he, be in favor he, of you would be in favor of tabling this and. I would love more discussion. Okay. All right. So. Uh, I make a motion that we uh, table this until we have more more clarity to the situation. I'll second that. Okay, there's a, there's a statement you guys have got to read before. Oh, <laughs> and Madam Chair, if I may, uh, if you would define the clarity that you're seeking. Um, I have the, no clue because this is just as clear as mud. I'm I mean, not being funny. If you, have, just, if you have questions, you're welcome to ask staff, but if, if, you, if you move to table to seek more clarity, staff would have to have some sort of direction as to what clarity is being requested or else we'll be in the same situation at the next meeting. May I say something? Go ahead. What I would like to see is somehow or other, let Mr. Buckles keep his operation, but limit his hours to a much shorter time and, you know, daylight hours. We still want to please the gentleman over here and the doctor says it is noisy, so we, you know, we, we want to please them too. We want to please everybody, at least I do. 
And it's going to take a little bit of. Pardon? He's okay with limited hours. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Mr. Buckles, if you want to talk to us, you need to be sworn in. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, we're about as liberal as we've ever been on the discussion today on, on a case. Amen. So, if you want, <laughs> we have usually strict, 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 and it goes bang, 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 and, and over it is. But if you want to talk, we will permit, permit it, but you have to be sworn in. Uh, but okay, what, for my, oh, you still have the floor, yeah, I'm sorry. What, what I was trying to say is, in the past, we have been chastised for going outside the rules, approving things that maybe we shouldn't have approved. To prevent that, maybe we do need to talk to see what we can do to keep everybody happy. I mean, well, let's face it, we're not gonna make everybody happy, but make them kind of compatible. Madam Chair, if I may address that point. Um, there, so there is no way within the code as it's written right now to allow them to continue their, op their operation of bringing logs on the site. So even if this were to be, th this, uh, this board could not approve that as the code is written right now. Okay. I know that the applicant continues to contend that there is a path forward through general agriculture because of the first part of the code that says that you would rely on a previous code if something is vague or ambiguous, but there is no vagueness there. For a commercial um, sawmill operation, it would go through industrial heavy. Now, if that could not be fit, or if a use could not be fit in a certain zoning district and there were, in fact, vagueness, then we would fall back on the old code. But because there's not any vagueness, we have to abide by this code. Yes, sir. I, with what he just said, um, I don't think waiting is going to matter because there would be a limited operation anyway with only four acres of trees to work with. No, I, I agree with you. He, he needs to bring trees in to, to stay well, in business. Not, that's, this and that's not, not, not going to happen. Bringing trees in. That is a, a point that's not, it's not, it's not up for discussion. Correct. Right. Madam Chairman. Um, Staff keeps calling it a commercial sawmill. Um, I have an issue with that because the fact, of the, I mean, it's not operating all the time. Um, from what was said, there was. I didn't hear. I didn't hear him say commercial. I, 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 he just said commercial just a minute ago. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, I was referring to the other path. The, the applicant alleges that because there's vagueness, that there's supposedly vagueness in the code for the commercial path, right. that somehow we would fall back on the old code for that commercial path. We're not alleging that this is a commercial, fully commercial. Okay. All right. Well, that, besides, I heard those words, so that's Understood. what I thought you were alleging, that it was a commercial. Yes. Um, sawmill. But, I mean... I mean, everything I'm hearing, he's not using it all the time. He's not using it, you know, I mean, he's cranking it up on the weekends, which I understand the neighbor, he's got to work. I work shift work too. I worked at the paper mill for 15 years. And anything that goes around outside of your house and going on keeps you from your regular work going on. But um, I'm understanding that it's, I mean, is this, is it being used on the weekends? I mean, is it just being used on a Saturday? Not all the other times, um, you know, I understand what you're saying about, uh, you know, that, that, that it just goes back to where it keeps, I, I keep thinking that it's just a, a family operated sawmill and that it's, you know, used for that purpose with the wood and stuff. I mean, and again, bartering the wood. Um, you know, giving the wood to other people, giving it away, um, things like that. Maybe sometimes using, you know, using it for commercial uses. Uh, I say commercial uses for, you know, getting it for other people for money. Um, I, I'm just having a hard time with, you know, a man that's his father and him had a sawmill, and now we're trying to take it away from him, I guess is what I'm trying to say. 
I'm not sure we're trying to take it away. It's just maybe we're we're trying to limit what has what is. I understand. To be done. But if if we if we do, that's what I was just fixed to state. If if we do that, then we are taking it away. It's not so. Well, then, if to me, if if there's going to be logs brought in from outside, and then you get into a commercial part of it. So yes, ma'am. I withdraw. A, I, would, I, I withdraw my motion, okay. Madam Chairman. Well, it, it, okay. All right, Mr. Buckles. I gave you an opportunity to come talk to us, and if you want to be sworn in, okay. Well, it is portable. Where are they going to move it to? Okay, please state your name and address for the record. Frank Buckles, 165 West Ranch Trail. Palaka? Palaka. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm born and raised. All right. Been here my whole life. Won't leave it. So, this property was given to me, like Dr. Benson said, from my grandmother. She bought it from Wayne and Anna Mae Benson to move up to plaque if something happened. I've been on that property since I was in diapers. The wetland area they talk about was a pond pushed by Wayne Benson with a dozer. I have a long history on that property. And this all falls to vent, and it's no, and just coincidence, but that sawing was a hobby my father and I did. It is not a commercial operation. I've spent way more money over there, and you can ask my wife, than I have ever brought in to do anything, even in barter for over there. It was my father and my relief. We worked industrial maintenance. He worked out at paper mill for 38 years. I went behind him, got a degree from the University of Florida, and I do industrial maintenance. We travel around. I've been gone for three weeks working an outage right now. This was my first day back in Palaka. Thank goodness I was able to get done and get back to hear this. For me, I never knew that I was doing anything wrong by running a portable bandsaw. This bandsaw may be long, but it's 20 foot long. It has a single axle underneath it, and it does have a two inch ball receiver tongue that you hook up to a pickup truck, anchor it down, and pull it to a job site and saw wood. I've had this sawmill. My father purchased it years back. He sawed every board in his house. It's V-tongue and groove, cedar and cypress through the whole house, except for one room, my sister's. My mother drew a line. She wanted some drywall and some color <laughs> somewhere. So this is a family heritage. My grandfather was a forestry manager for First St. Regis Paper Company. He sawed lumber. I've got chairs I made that were cypress logs that were so large that they had to be sawn with a chainsaw first to get them on the large sawmills that was dug out of the swamps. It's just a history. It's a family thing. And we used, I lived out at that property. My wife, I had a 1970-something peach or whatever, single wide, and about the third time I fell through the floor, she said, I gotta do something different. And I said, well, you find somewhere and we'll move. And lo and behold, two weeks later, she had papers when I come back to Palaka to sign. She bought a house not far from that, on, West, on the other side of 19. So I still live in that area. To me, and I know there's laws, but I didn't know I was breaking anything. My buildings, they're pole barns and Connex trailers, and I kind of knew I figured it'd be easier to ask for forgiveness and, and permission. permission. <laughs> and I knew that, and I apologize for that. I, I know that's kind of wrong, but that's kind of a family thing. <laughs> so when this come up, I didn't know I was upsetting anybody. The sawmill does make noise. It's a lawnmower engine and the blade makes a noise going through the thing. It is a bandsaw, but I am limited production. I do the maintenance at commercial sawmills for Georgia Pacific, West Frazier. They saw more in one minute than I can saw in a whole day. One minute. That's the difference in production. The trees that are on site right now is because of the lack of time getting over there. And that large amount was a friend clearing land on Lundy Road. Man, I don't know what to do with these logs. Can I bring them over? Yeah, what do you want to do with them? He goes, well, I want some. How about we saw on halves? 
So that is what the plan was to saw on halves. He is Alaskan fisherman. He'll be back in October. And I called him last week and said, I haven't sawed a thing. <laughs> and it, basically, it's not because of the zoning stuff. That didn't scare me. I didn't know I was still bothering anybody. It was because I lost my father. That was our thing. I ran the mill. He ran a loader, sat in the air condition. And the buildings was to, we're finally kind of moving ourselves up in the world. That mill was portable. When the gentleman who spoke earlier, it was up close to his house. The reason was because David was selling it. I wanted everybody to know that whoever was buying that place, that there was a sawmill on this property. So I put it up front, and I tried to run it as often as I could while that house was for sale. I would looked at buying that house, but I couldn't come to just terms with David on price. So I didn't take it. Hindsight, man, I wish I would have got that. And that property was split. That used to be one piece. So to me, to listen to this, it's a hobby. It's a release. I love cutting wood. I don't sell it for a commercial business. I don't sell lumber. Every once in a while, I'll sell some boards for somebody's fence or something to somebody who comes up. But most of the time, we trade. It's always been a barter for the most part. There's a few every now and then, but there's no business there. There's not Frank Buckle Sawmill Incorporated. There's no money changing hands that is anything more than a couple dollars here and there. It's usually on trade. So it feels like that you're just shutting me down. And I apologize to my neighbor if I upset them with bringing logs in up front. I can keep that limited to the very back of the property. I can limit the way that I bring logs in. I use an Anderson dump trailer is what he's talking about. Gooseneck dump trailer. I've had it for years. I bought it after Katrina or something like that storm, and I got a deal after they come back and stuff. So I've had that trailer for a long time, and we it's easy to put logs in and bring them. And I was using the front as a laydown yard, basically. But I can limit that, and that is actually going to be limited because my wife and I are deciding we're, we may do other things to the front. The front never was going to be built because if my sisters, my in-laws, or somebody needed a house or somewhere to live, we would always put have that available to extend to family. That's why there's no buildings up front, and it's all everything up there is something we can move away in case I need to build a house up there. That's the intent of that property. That property will not change hands for me. I will not sell it for any dime. And I'm raising my children to have that principle and philosophy of land. My father believed in land. He does tax certificates. He has 40-something plus pieces of property on Putnam County. And the reason he, what pieces he looked at was things with timber on it. His thought was, well, when we run out of wood and nobody gives us anything and we want to cut something to make some more boards here or there, then he'd have properties that he could go cut a tree off of and bring. Some of the properties have nice trees, hardwoods, or things like that that are different than the longleaf pines that I have growing on the middle section of my property. So these are just the things that I wanted to let you know, sort of my story. Justin argued, I don't know zoning. I can, like Dr. Ben said, he can talk mess and well, I can talk bearings. I can teach you about machineries. We can laser align. I can do vibration analysis. And I can talk to you about solid boards. I've done it for a long time. I've been around it since I was a kid. But to act that my sawmill is anything large and that I don't have time, I'm not out there much. It's not a major operation. When I'm not on a job, I would go over there and run the mills during the week some. I try to limit my operation. I am always somewhat trying to keep my neighbors in mind. And I've asked neighbors, a neighbor directly behind me, Officer Heath, I asked him because he moved in lately and he came around there in his patrol car and I thought, what did I do now? <laughs> and I asked him, does it bother you? He goes, no, it's a, it's a noise. He said, but it's not anything that bothers me in my yard from what it is. I have no objections to fencing. I actually have a byproduct from sawing. It's slabs. When you square up a log, you get a flat one end, rounded of the other. And I've always said if I needed to, I could use those to build a fence. And that would be a substantial fence. It would have density to it. So it would be something that would knock noise down. Limiting where I, how and stuff, I have no problems with that. But it's still, I'm not a business. If I was a business, I'd say slap it to me. 
you could tell me how to run that thing, but I'm not a commercial sawmill. I'm just a guy with a hobby. And I might have a little bit more money invested in it than the other guys do with their hobby, but I don't have a big boat. <laughs> That's where I sink my money into is extra, is that property and my sawmill and doing things on that property, making furniture, my, my bed, my children's beds, I've made all of those. Um, and I'm working on my mother redoing her since my father passed away just too much and building her a new one. That's what that sawmill is about. It is not about commercial. It is not about growth. I never want to grow. I got enough work to do. I don't need to add that to my plate. And it would take a significant from the mill I have, which is old, very old, and because of my line of work, I'm able to keep it running and stalling decently. To upgrade to a commercial status would be a $100,000 investment. And it would be bringing it electrical, not gas powered from a lawnmower. It would be three phase brought to the property to do that. So as far as where I am, just giving you a history of my property and where I stand, if there's regulations, I, I would love to be able to keep my mill there and I would love to be able to bring logs from properties that my family owned, that my dad spent money to get so that we can cut a you know, cedar tree off of these or a sweet gum off of that one. I don't mind restrictions. I don't want to make my neighbors mad. I am a placa boy. We don't want to make neighbors mad because, you know, neighbors will get you, <laughs> you know, in, in, in one way or another. So I don't mind restrictions. I just would love to be able to keep doing what I do on my property that I have been doing for years, what my family has been doing for years. Maybe not there, and you might not have a picture because that thing was on wheels and I saw it in the sun since I was in high school. And we'd move it there for a little bit, saw some stuff. We'd move it to another property and saw stuff. Or we'd move it to a friend's house and leave it. But the path we're taking right now does pretty much take what I've done there over the years. And I will, if, if even if you give me a special use permit, I will be taking that sawmill away from there. Because if I can't bring in a cedar tree, there's no cedar trees on that property. If I can't bring in a cypress tree, if I can't bring in something else here and there, and I understand it's hard to limit and stuff like that, I guess the way to, to control it is I got neighbors. They still have the ability to call. So if I get out of any means, I guess they'll call and we'll be back here again. But to go the route we're going takes a long history of what my family does and just throws it away of what I've worked myself, my contribution to the family, bringing it up to something different away. Okay, I have a question for you because you said you would like to bring in wood from other places. Were you, were you not aware of the stipulation where it said they, it was never discussed with you, that you could not bring anything on your property? I have taught, before this, I had no clue that I'd doing anything wrong period I didn't know I know a lot of people with portable sawmills sitting in their yards where they cut wood bring stuff to and from so didn't think that me and the I know of at least 12 other guys in this county who do the same thing we're doing anything wrong as we've been going through this process the whole time through the whole argument of I still like Mr. Morris that whole stipulation is saying from this property, from this property, we were asking and saying that that's not what we want to do. That's not how we want to do it. But I get getting told this is the only path forward. This is the only path forward. So, Madam Chair, are, this is my path forward. Sorry. So you will have to admit, though, there's a lot of lumber or a lot of dead and, I mean, well, and trees on your so, property. And, and, and that's I do admit. And part of that's my clean, cleaning up and things like that. So when Irma came through, man everybody because they knew i had one i would come by there and be like what and it would just be people drop stuff there so i had and a lot of that hardwood to one side is still from irma and I, you can only burn so much i uh, can't afford to take it to the landfill to pay the fees there so i've been working to clean that up the logs that were brought in was and i had no idea of what the amount was going to be when we were, you know, hey, we're clearing some land on Lundy Road. I've got a few pine logs. You want it? And a few pine logs turned to a lot of pine logs. <laughs> so 
I do, and in the years I've done that, that is the most logs I've ever had. It's amazing how this world and everything comes to alignment. That's the most logs I've had on site at one time, hands down. Yeah, but there's some also, and that's just some eight by eights that are on that, but they're... Uh, what, up front? So that was a tree surgeon brought that wood back to me that he had somebody else saw, and he didn't stack it right, and he just dumped it, had his guys dump it there, I guess thinking that I could stack it and dry it for him under one of my lumber barns. That's quite a pile, too. Oh, which pile? The 8 by 8s the big. Well, they're big. They're all different sizes. So, I mean. And he wanted to build a large timber thing, and they're just sitting there. And the reason I haven't touched them because he has not contacted me, and I haven't been able to get a hold of him because they're basically rotten. If you look at them, they were kind of rotten. Well, okay. Any questions for Mr. Buckles? All right. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Madam Chairman, if I may um, yes, address a point, I'd like to just share some of the discussions that we had with Mr. Buckles and Mr. Morris leading up to this. We had many discussions with them. At no point did staff ever intend on class, uh, um, classifying this as a commercial enter, uh, business. I think I, 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 I thought that I had express that already, but the applicant uh, apparently thinks that we continue to, to harp on that point and we don't. And, and the staff's intention was never to shut this enterprise down. Um, the, the conditions that are on there are to satisfy the criteria of the special use permit. We, staff cannot recommend approval, one, on something that is not in accordance with the code, two, on something that violates the special use permit criteria. So um, if I may briefly just go through those uh, conditions, because none of what the applicant just described will be um, prohibited by these conditions if the conditions are, are met. And as a sidebar, uh, quickly, um, the applicant had previously stated that he has other properties so if this is a portable sawmill then if he runs out of uh, trees on this property then he could have applied for a special use permit for those other properties that could have been coupled with this special use permit as well we could have reviewed them con concurrently the applicant decided not to submit those so we advise the applicant as well okay so if it's a hobby of yours and you intend on constructing furniture for your family Nothing prevents a homeowner from running a small saw at their property on a hobby basis, simply on a hobby basis, not for business purposes, to construct furniture. So that being said, condition number one is straight from the code. It, it uh, advises that no wood materials may be brought onto the premises. We cannot do anything about this. I, I see that the, the desire of the applicant is to advocate for that, but not even this board could grant a variance to that um, stipulation. And, and regardless, there's no variance or, excuse me, request. Um, there was at one point a, an application in for a, a land development code change that was withdrawn when they decided to go forward with the special use permit. The special use, when we had the pre-application for the special use permit, the applicant was advised that staff would be conditioning. Uh, we didn't have all of the conditions there because we didn't have the full request there and we hadn't had t a, ch a chance to review the full request. But the applicant was advised that there would be conditions to mitigate the impact. So we don't only consider the rights of the property owner, but we also consider the public welfare here. And there are property owners all around this area that have a right to the enjoyment of their property as well. Uh, condition number two, the impregnating or, and or sa saturation of wood products on the subject site. I'm not sure if they have an issue with that. That's simply to satisfy the criterion that says that no hazardous substances be um, located on the site. So the use of copper arsenate preservatives, are it is very dangerous and it has to be contained. So. I'm not sure if they have a contention with that. I don't think they do, but just to, as an explanation of that. Number three, the buffer. The buffer, that is the smallest buffer that we have. And so as ex I, I explained earlier, it can either have a, a row of six foot evergreen trees or a fence. That deals more with the visual impact of the buildings rather than any kind of noise abatement. Four is 
to deal with the noise abate, uh, abatement. So as I stated previously, if the board would like to recommend uh, d additional language be added to that or altered language, um, that is within the competence of this board and staff would pose no objection to it. Um, to, uh, I guess, better define it as was previously discussed, uh, five, all existing and future buildings on the site shall be properly permitted. That's because the buildings are, or some of them at least, are not properly permitted. So when we go to the special use criteria, the, one of the most important ones here is number 10, the proposed special use will not adversely affect the general public health, safety, and welfare of the residents of Putnam County. Um, uh, number seven, adequate screening and buffering of the special use will be provided. So buffering doesn't only entail vegetative screening, but also noise abatement. Um, and uh, the special use will not substantially diminish or impair property values in the area or impede the orderly development and improvement of the surrounding property for permitted uses. So there are permitted residential uses in the surrounding property. So I could, I could go on and on, but I just, I wanted to fully explain staff's intention here, and it is not to shut down a business that has, according to, okay, a hobby, again, <laughs> a hobby. So a hobby that's um, been there for an unknown number of years because the applicant, again, could not produce any sort of documentation showing that it was even an, a, a non-conforming vested use. Excuse me, sir. Um, so that, that is the position of staff. Staff does not try to remove vested rights. In, in fact, this is staff's attempt to continue the operation while balancing the welfare of the, the remaining public around them. Okay. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Gabriel, can condition three and four more or less be uh, combined to um, where there'd be a buffer and fence around the equipment as well as the property between the residents? Um, so condition three, they could be um, as long as, as the buffer, so the buffer has to be in the, in the immediate area because it's a code required buffer. Um, or excuse me, not in the immediate area, but along the property lines surrounding the use. Right. But if you could supplement that buffer to where he has to put up a wall or some sort of noise abase, uh, abatement in that buffer, then yes, I, I think that you could meet the, that, the intent that of that. would both. not require him from having to have a building? Correct. Okay, now in condition one, can that be amended to require require a limited amount of wood to be brought on the property, and then we have to agree on what a limited amount of wood is, you would have to depend on the residents to notify us if a huge tractor trailer came in there and dropped wood, but cannot not be adjusted to where both sides can live with it. No, sir, we can't under the parameters of the current land development code. The code prohibits it outright. Okay, uh, now under this board, we can just totally eliminate condition one. You could, but it wouldn't prevent the fact that he could not bring the, the wood on site. That was just put there for clarity's sake. So he would still be in violation of the land development code if he were to bring any kind of wood from off site. Okay, since this is a portable unit and, and the applicant is not up here, uh, if he has other family property or other people that want wood planed or, or, or worked on, how much trouble is it to pull your sawmill to where they are and do the work? Wait, wait, time out, time out. To get this on official, you need to come forward Come on up. This needs to be official and on the record. But I thought, Mr. West, I thought that he did not want to take his portable sawmill to his other pieces of property. Uh, I, I don't intend to because you move a sawmill, then you have to stack, then I have to move it back to the property to put it under barns to stack to dry. So what it's, we're looking at is there's no way we can work around condition one. 88-1, if you reverted back to that, would, would allow that. I don't know. Based on whose opinion? <laughs> well, and that's, I mean, you look at 
I mean, even the law looks at presence of what things have happened before and how things have been ruled. So, and there's other instances. So, I mean, it's the whole purpose of what I've done out there with the lean-to that is sitting under and, and the barns and stuff like that is to make life easier. It's moving up in the world. Yes, it, it looks like I'm something, but it's really just taken from the kid who pulled a sawmill around or had his dad pull it around and saw wood to, all right, I'm tired of standing in the sunshine all day and stuff. I'm getting older, and I'd like to be in the shade and stuff like that. So that's where that is on that. No, I would not like to have to try to pull the sawmill to each property and set it up, level it out, and, and do those items, not for my own personal use. Now, if I was a business and I was charging a gentleman to do that, I get a charge for that time spent. So that would be great. For me, it's definitely easier to go out there, throw some trees on the trailer, and bring them back to the sawmill. If you're going to make a point, you need to come have it. And then, then we're going to uh, come to some kind of a conclusion. Yes, ma'am. No, I, I it's, it's, um, every avenue to this, leads to something else. But to, this dead horse. If I can make one point, you, this board approved a special <laughs> use permit for a sawmill in 2005 for the mulch plant. 2005. That's, is that a commercial plant? That is, that is, that is an industrial strength okay, commercial. So this let me, is let, not the same. I, I, I know, but let, let me just say that the restrictions, not the restrictions, the basis for the approval, if you go back and read the minutes of that, the basis for that approval came from Recom staff recommendations. Mike Brown, who's been doing this much longer than anybody here before he retired in 05, staff recommendation for the, the SUP for the chip mill cited. It didn't cite the current land development code. It was an 05 after land development code, but he did not cite the land development code. What he cited, what Mike Brown cited in the approval or in the staff recommendations for the special use permit for the mulch plant, he cited 88 1. That's the whole thing that led me to that because a, a, a professional in the planning department on, in this building under the more extreme sawmill conditions approved and recommended for approval without the stipulation of logs coming from somewhere else or coming from the site, this staff, this board with the same land development code that we are using today cited 88.1 because it was on ag zone property and the, it was the, the trees were not coming from that site. That threw it into a completely different category. And that is why Mike Brown recommended approval and cited, if I can't say anything, he cited and used 88.1 in 2005 when they approved a special use permit. That's, if, if it doesn't get any more precedent Mr. set Morris, than that. Mr. Morris, isn't that thing, isn't that chip mill a commercial industrial use? So you're saying that you would rather. No, I'm just asking. No, yes, it is. It is a okay. commercial use. But what, what, but what you're saying in this condition right here is you're willing to impose less of a restriction on an industrial level mill than you are on a personal hobby mill because we're trying to cram it in a hole in the land development code. When clearly staff said in 05 that you revert to 88.1. They reverted. I've got the copy of the, of right. the ordinance there. Not, so that, not, that is okay. my only point is. To my point is we're not going to debate what was approved in 2005. That's not. But it's a, precedent. That's, that's, I mean, that may the, be a precedent. The, the attorney will tell you that his whole career is based on precedent. And how can you issue a SUP to an industrial level on zoned ag with more restriction than, with less restriction than you're going to do to a, to a hobby mill? I mean, that, that's, that's the whole okay. point. Okay. All right. Thank you. Madam Chairman. Now, I am this time sticking to my guns. <laughs> I will not enter <laughs> entertain any other outside comments other than the board. So at this time, this discussion is closed to the public, and the board will now either make a motion in discussion or come to some kind of resolution. Madam Chairman, um, by being from what I'm understanding, this board's hands are tied, um, and I hate to even do what I'm going to what I'm going to move to do, just for the purpose of the fact that I don't believe in what I'm fixing to do. But um, I think it needs to go to a higher power than us 
Mr. Buckles, I apologize for that. But I mean, you know, the, like um, the chairman said, we are tied to certain things that we have to do. And, um, you know, I mean, that we, as a board, we are, we're tied. Not, not, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know any other way to do this, but in, 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 in moving this, this would leave you to have to appeal to a higher power than us. And, um, but I move that we deny or approve the special case number SUP 21-008. Um, I don't even know if I'm right saying this right, but I, I mean, I just, I want to, as staff recommendation. Okay. Okay. And get the chairman to sign and the, the final order. And get the chairman to sign the final order. Second. Okay. We have a motion and second to approve special use SUP 21-008. Is there any further discussion? If not, all in favor. May I ask a question? Question. If we approve this, we're saying they can do everything they want, but bring lumber into there. Yes, that's what it says. Number one and says we cannot. Say, and if we say no, they can't do anything. Correct. And it does away with the code case. It does away with the code case. So if we approve it, then he gets to continue. To what? Well, based on the recommendations. So. We have a motion and a second to approve SUP 21-008. Is there any further discussion? If not, all of those in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. One, two, three, four, five. Motion carries 5-0. Mr. Buckles and Mr. Morris, you have a 30-day appeal process. You can take this decision and whatever you decide to circuit court. So, good luck. Yes. Madam Chair, just for clarity's sake, if, if I may, um, that was with the five conditions, yes, uh, with Mr. Killebrew? Yes, he didn't change anything. He said with conditions. With conditions. With the con okay, thank you. Oh, my God. Okay, my goodness. All right, the next case is variance 21-004. We can see it. <laughs> they got it working, yeah. <coughs> this is a variance for Robert LaMonaco. Location is three, uh, 432 Cove Drive, Satsuma. The parcel size is 0 0.10 acres. Uh, zoning is R2. Future land use is rural residential. The request is for a reduction in side setbacks for two Oops. unpermitted sheds. The subject property lies within the Hermit's Cove unrecorded plat dated December 1966 and administratively vested on October, in October of 1997. The applicant acquired the property on March 11, 2021. The previous property owner obtained an administrative variance, a yard modification, uh, granted on February 10, 2017 for a reduction of the front setback from 25 to 20 feet for placement of the existing mobile home. The property contains an open code enforcement case 2021-00257 for the placement of two sheds without building permits and for encroachment within the side required side yard setbacks. The applicant is requesting a variance to allow two sheds to be located 1.6 feet from the eastern side of the property line and 0 0.09 feet from the western property line. The exact sizes of the sheds have not been accurately determined as the application for this variance is inconsistent with the permit application submitted um, in an attempt to rectify the existing code violations. Um, one of the unpermitted buildings, shed number two, is listed on the variance application as of having 140 square feet, but the building permit submitted reflects 160 square feet. Staff notes that a building exceeding 150 square feet would not be subject to a three-foot side setback as the applicant implies the building is regulated by, but would be subject to the principal side setback of 10 feet. This is the future land use, the zoning. This is the aerial of the property. Special condition 
conditions and circumstances exist which are uh, peculiar to the land uh, structure or building involved. The subject property is considered vested for the development of a single family residential purposes. The, purpose, the parcel does not meet the minimum size or, or requirements. Special conditions do exist as the dimensional standards for the zoning district. The special conditions and the circumstances as described uh, do not result from a failure of the applicant's part to follow applicable county, state, federal codes. The parcel, of course, as stated earlier, was created in 1966 prior to the Land Development Code, and the non-conforming is therefore not a direct result of the action of the applicant. However, these special circumstances are not applicable to the present request for a variance as the lack of compliance with the code is the result of the action of the by the applicant, namely the installation of two sheds without permits and with, within the required site setbacks. If the applicant had sought the proper permitting for the two subject accessory buildings, the encroachment would not have passed the final inspection of the, of the building. Granting of the variance requested would not confer with the applicant special privilege that is denied by this code to other lands. Granting the present variance request would confer on the applicant as a special privilege that is denied by the code to other lands within the same zoning district. The encroachment of the structures into the required site setback is due to the failure of the applicant to follow the requirements of the Putnam County Code of Ordinances. The site contains sufficient area to allow proper placement of the structure outside the required setbacks. Literal interpretation of the provisions of the ordinance would deprive the applicant of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties in the same zoning district. Literal interpretation of this ordinance would not deprive the applicant of rights commonly enjoyed by other property owners in the same zoning district. Any property within the R2 zoning district is afforded the same uses with respect to placement of accessory structures. Sizes and number of accessory structures are dependent upon the area of the size of the site due to siting. Impervious coverage and setback requirements of land development code. Accessory structures may be placed on the subject property in conformance with the same requirements of the Land Development Code. The variance granted is the minimum variance that would make possible reasonable use of the land, building, or structure. The general intent of the purpose of this requirement is for the minimum side setbacks from property lines <coughs> to ensure adequate spacing of structures and buildings from adjoining properties to ensure sufficient separation of structures, buildings, for life and fire safety reasons and to prevent encroachments on adjoining properties and, and detrimental visual impacts on adjoining properties. The surrounding, and the surrounding neighborhood, granting of this present variance would violate the intent of the Land Development Code 45-105 because the subject buildings would remain with little separation between adjoining buildings and the properties and poses potentially detrimental visual impacts on the adjoining properties due to the proximity of the buildings to said properties. Granting of this variance will be in harmony with the general intent and purpose of this ordinance and would not be injurious to the area involved or otherwise detrimental to public welfare. As further explained in the report, staff finds that there is sufficient area on the property to allow compliance with the minimum required setbacks without the need of this variance. Staff finds that the requested variance does not meet the criteria required for issuance of a variance stipulated in section 45 dash 833.01 of the Land Development Code. Therefore, staff recommends denial of the requested variance. In addition, we have received three um, emails from neighboring properties in opposition to this variance. Okay, thank you. Any questions from staff? Okay, if none, let's do a roll call for site visit, please. I was there and I spoke to the applicant briefly. He was talking about uh, getting legal help with this. Okay, he, he's mentioned you. We'll get to you in just a minute. Okay. Mark Fisher? Yes. Ed Killebrew? Yes. Linda Osborne? Yes. Longway? Yes. Mark Fisher? Yes, I, you got me. I I thought you did. <laughs> I heard my name. <laughs> did you say anything? Do you think it was you? <laughs> I know. I'm always told to shut up. <laughs> yeah, we ought to be careful with that, don't we? Uh, okay.
Okay, with the applicant, Robert, is it LaMonico? Would you like to come forward and address this board? For the record, please state your name and address. Uh, Robert LaMonico, 432 Cove Drive in Satsuma. Okay, you want to discuss what? Yeah, I, um, first of all, when I, when I put these sheds in, it was shortly after I moved into the property, and there were just these pre-built sheds that got delivered and, and sat there. I did not know I even needed a permit to have those there. Um, I got a notice that there was a problem, and the problem was uh, the setbacks and also that the size of the property would not permit the shed, so I needed to get rid of them, basically. Um, it was like the over the 35% land coverage. Um, so I, I had just had a survey done when I bought the property, and I looked at it and did some calculating and found that the numbers that they were using were not correct. So I had to go to the uh, tax assessor's office and get them to agree with my calculation, which they did, and they made a correction in the, whatever, in the computer. Um, and that would allow the, the land coverage to have these sheds. So the only issue then was the setbacks. Um, then I, I was, kind of getting ready with getting paperwork and stuff ready for this meeting. And I got a call last week that it was going to be, the, the staff was recommending denial because the setback is a Florida state uh, building code. And they said that you can't give me a variance if it's a Florida state building code based on the setbacks. So I, I, at this point, I don't understand, you know, what the rules are. And I just said I, I probably need to get an attorney so that I can understand this. And um, because of the timing, this all happened late last week. I tried to reach an attorney. I finally got to an attorney's office on Monday, uh, but he was too busy to be able to do anything. So what I'm saying is if, if in fact it's kind of a, a dead issue because of the Florida state building codes, then you know, I, I just wasted my time and your time even, even addressing this thing. And the $500 fee, they should have known this before we even got into the variance thing. Um, so at this point, I spoke to the attorney's office this morning, and they just recommended that I postpone this, uh, if, again, if that's the case, um, uh, probably until next month so that the attorney can have time to review it all. So I guess my position at this point is, can you give me a variance on this or can you not? You know, if, you, if you're legally bound to not give me a variance, then again, we're, we're just kind of wasting time. Um, so should we postpone this and, and I'll get the lawyer to, uh, to look at it? Or should we just go ahead with it? I, Mr. Gay, would you like to answer that from the standpoint of the um, state statute and or? Yes, uh, Madam Chair. The issue of the state statute is is really irrelevant to this variance request. So he was the the applicant was advised that the state statute does have minimum requirements for separation bet between buildings and also from property lines. However, the variance request was denied principally and uh, actually entirely on the criteria of the variance. So Initially, the, the applicant had sought to submit for an administrative variance. The applicant was advised that staff could not support the administrative variance, which is a variance that's handled by staff, because 
staff is bound by the same criteria that the Zoning Board of Adjustments is bound by. So then the applicant was advised that the other route would be to submit a variance application to the Zoning Board of Adjustments, uh, that that would be the only other route, um, short of amending the Land Development Code, which staff would never support, uh, because the issue here is that structures were placed on the site without a building permit. The side setbacks are not substantial. They're three feet. It's very small. Um, in fact, well, Anyway, the, so the, they're, they're small setbacks, and um, so these structures are, if in fact they're less than 150 square feet, which we later found that one of the structures is a little greater than 150 square feet, but assuming that they are less than 150 square feet, then they would not require a building permit for just an accessory shed. It would re require a zoning permit. So that's the point, the, the permit that the applicant did not obtain and that's why it was placed incorrectly on the site. The, slide, the site has more than adequate space to accommodate that. The issue is that, um, and with absolutely no judgment made on the applicant, but there is a very large RV parked on the site. This is already a very small site and nowhere in the code does it guarantee maximum um, coverage of the site. In fact, the site is bound to a 35 percent maximum coverage. If that's correct, Wendy? Yes. That's okay. what I was told. Yeah. Yes, sir. So the issue here is that the applicant does not meet the variance criteria, um, not that the Florida Building Code requires a three-foot separation. Um, and that's why staff recommended denial, as we had initially uh, advised him um, in the uh, initial request for an administrative variance. Um, and we advised him we would process the request for an administrative variance, but also that he would lose the money because we had evaluated it and determined he was not he was not qualified for it. So uh, that's all. Thank you, Madam okay. Chair. Another oh, sorry. go ahead. So, so there is the room there to have the proper setbacks. It, it, that's staff's opinion. Yes, I I, I and uh, the senior planner visited the site, and there is sufficient space. I mean, we're talking about on one side. I think the building is placed at like 0.9 feet <laughs> from the, the side setback, so he'd only have to move it 2.1 feet. That's not very much. And then on the other side, I can't remember now, but it's, it's also not very much. Um, can, can I interrupt for a second? It, it, Madam moving. Chair, if you allow it. Okay, let him finish. Okay. Um, so yes, to answer your question, staff is of the, the opinion that there is no hardship on the site. Okay. okay. The the uh, code also says I think it needs to be three feet from the house and three feet from the property line, and there's uh, I have the two sheds, ones on each side of the house. The lot at that point is is very narrow. It's pie shaped, goes down to the canal, and the. Uh, the, the code, I think, is three feet from the house, and having both sides covered like that, I, I wanted to make them four feet from the house so I'd have access to the backyard with four feet instead of three. And I can't, if I move it closer to the house, I'd have to get closer than three feet to get, in other words, there's not an extra six feet there. You wanted a pathway between where your mobile home is sitting and where the two sheds are to be able to go between them to, to the... What's that? I'm sorry. I said, the way you have it set, set up now is that you have two sheds. Right. You have the mobile home in the front. Right. I mean, in the middle. In the middle. And you have the large, it looks like a larger shed on the left and a, and a smaller right. shed on the right. right. So you wanted the, the, to be able to go between the two sheds to get to the canal? Between the shed and the house to get okay. to the backyard. So is there, so Mr., is there a rule that he has to be three feet from the house? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, there is a rule. So he would have to maintain that clearance. Um, but so if going back to the issue of the recreational vehicle, not that, not that that's an issue, but uh, the recreational vehicle occupies a, a, an enormous part of that lot. Um, 
and the structures could very well be accommodated in those areas in staff's opinion. Of course, the applicant would have to prove this in a zoning permit, and the applicant would also not have incurred the cost of the buildings, which I'm sure is a consideration of his, um, if the zoning permits had been denied for the reasons of noncompliance with the land development code. So, okay, uh, the, the uh, RV, um, the, the, the lot is kind of pie-shaped, so it's, it's wider at the front by the street end. And if I moved the sheds all the way to the front, there would be enough width that I could have the sheds and enough walkway and three feet at least from the sides. And I'd have to, you know, store the RV someplace else because, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to keep the RV on my property uh, if I did that because I wouldn't be able to get around them to put the RV in, in behind them. But I have a so, question for you about the RV. What's that? I, would, I said, I have a question for you about the RV. Yeah. How would you possibly be able to move it? There's a power pole in front of it. Oh, yeah, I, I, I got it in there. You got it in there with the trailer and, and the that? power pole there? That's, that's I said, you got that RV backed in with the power pole there and the, and the, and the mobile home there. The RV is the, mo the motor home. Right, the RV, yeah. the motor home. Well, you must, yeah, be, I, yeah. you must be Houdini. <laughs> it's there. <laughs> it's there. I wondered. Okay, no, how's, it, he, uh, how's he going to get it out? It, it, okay. It's it's, fair, it's big, but it's fairly maneuverable, and you know it Does took it me like. Middle? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> it took me a couple of tries, but I was able to get in there. Okay. I, I did request for the electric company to move the pole because it's like blocking, but they said no. Okay. So anyway, um, so my choice is. If I, if I can't get the variance, I mean, I could move the sheds a foot closer to the house, to three feet, and it, I mean, it's not a big deal to move them, and that would get me a little bit more, or I can move them if I need to get the three feet from the house and three feet from the property line, uh, I would have to move the sheds toward the street and get rid of the motorhome. Towards the street? What about toward the canal? I mean, we didn't, I didn't go behind to look at the no, canal. No, it gets narrower toward the canal. No, it, and it goes down the hill. They, they, they can't go back further. Okay. Yeah. Madam so. Chairman? Yes, sir. You just, with my whole mind was thinking there when you said get rid of the motorhome. Um, I mean, I don't, if you've got a motorhome, you may be financially able to do this, but a lot of people take their uh, RVs and what have you and put them in, into these storage lots. Yeah, I could do that. You know, or I can sell it. You know. <laughs> Um, that was just an idea. I, I, yeah. my, my position is this is my yard and I want to put the RV there and yes, you know I'm, I'm saying the shed is uh, uh, one of them is I think 1.6 feet from the property line and the other one is just like 0. 0.9 right. feet or something. Um, the neighbor's properties on both sides are larger properties. My lot is one of the smallest around. And those larger properties have sheds that have apparently been there for a long time, but they're closer to my property line than my sheds are. So it's not like I'm irritating those neighbors or something. And you mentioned that there were some three, there emails, were th there three were th different we, people. We had three from yeah. your neighbors. Can I find out who or why or what, what their objection is? Yes, yeah, sir. You you may either inspect them here, or um, we can send you copies of those as a public records. Yeah, can I? Or as public records. Can I look records. at that right now? And I, I just certainly. Uh, Wendy would be happy to give you a copy of them. And I tell you what, the buildings on either side of here probably look like they're almost backed right up against the issue. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, the issue was brought up uh, about the adjoining properties on both sides and that those buildings look like I mean they're probably right up against the fence but were those buildings placed prior to the uh, setback. setback requirements or they just have been there so long that nobody said anything yeah you mean the buildings oh yes uh, yes they were both of them I believe I put in the report they were from 
the early 90, one was oh, 1988 maybe. and one was 1990. They both look like it, it was almost next to his shed. Right, but if for some reason any of those structures um, have 50% or more damage or are taken down, they would have to now meet now current meet the, code. The, the, the code. And as a clarification well, on the setbacks, if getting the advantage of being able to do it, and he's not. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt no. your discussion. Um, talking out of turn anyway. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> he was talking. What's that? <laughs> he was ahead. talking out of turn anyway. <laughs> um, Madam Chair, if I may, the so I want to stress the point again that it's three feet if the structure is 150 square feet or less. If one of them is over 150 square feet, when he submits. Uh, for his zoning permit, we will require a building permit, and um, that setback would be 10 feet. Ooh. So there may be a possibility, unless that one structure that appears to be larger than the 150 square feet is somehow reduced, um, it would have to be probably removed from the site because he could never, uh, or the, the applicant could never um, meet that setback. But again, that would have been caught at the building permit stage or the zoning permit stage. You know, my, my point with the neighbor's sheds being closer than mine is that my sheds being there uh, are not like making the neighborhood look ugly or anything. Uh, the sheds are, are you know, if you've seen them, they're nice sheds. They look nice. The only issue is, you know, the, a couple feet on the sidelines. <coughs> so, um, well, the issue has also that there's new new codes that were in, in, in uh, put into place yeah. after so after those other sheds were on the building. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that those sheds should be torn down. I'm well, saying no, they, you know, we can't. So, okay, line. Mr. Gabriel, I have a question for you. Yeah. If these sheds are able to be moved, can the sheds be moved closer together, or do they have to maintain the three feet distance from each shed? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. They would have to maintain, any structure would have to maintain a three foot distance from each other. Right, okay. So from the mobile home from the to mobile the mobile home from the, both sheds. Yes, ma'am. From, from the sideline and from each other or any yes. other and building. The, and right? the yes, back of yeah. the mobile home. Yeah. No, Sorry. not the mobile home, I don't think. Yes, you would have to yes. maintain clearance from oh, the, the mobile, mobile home. Oh, the mobile home, the house. The yeah. house. Yeah. Okay. The house. I thought the you meant the mobile One without the other. One and the other. And he's talking about moving them to the front. I didn't see room enough to put one in the front, but well, it's you also possible. have a, a car, whatever it is, a car tow that's there in the front. The car? The, the car, they do, isn't that a, like a car tow or something like that? Uh, what, what do you call it? Oh, there's a, there's a boat trailer on one side, uh, which I'm probably gonna get rid of that. But then there's also um, there's a, a tow, tow thing, tow, tow dolly thing. for the yeah. for the tow motor dolly home. or whatever you want to call it in front. So I didn't see any place that you could put a shed in the front. So the applicant, or and I should say the owner, because they're the same. Uh, the owner would have to find some way to move the items on the on the site, and it may result in some of them having to be removed from the site. It's simply just a very small lot. Very small. So he could possibly move the small one. Well, he'd have to move the big one to get the small one out of there. <laughs> so. Well, they can be moved. You know, the, the company that made them, they have a machine that just picks it up and moves it but around. But that would so. be another um, thing to, to, to deal with because he's asking for a variance and that has nothing to do with moving, unless he did move the sheds totally, then he wouldn't have to have the variance. So. Correct, and that's what we based our well, denial on, could. on the fact that he can either move them and, and there would be sufficient space if some of the items on the site would be removed, or if it's not feasible on the site because of the small, small, excuse me, smallness of the site, we again go back to that there's no hardship on the site. There's no topographical issue on the site that would prevent siting of accessory structures. He still has the ability to site those on there, but concurrent with the size of the lot, just as anyone else would have to mine the size of their lot. But today, we're only here for to consider the variance. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, any other questions for Mr. LaMonico? Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. So what, what, well, what happens now? 
We'll, we'll, somebody will will make a motion or do something in a few minutes, and you will know what's going to happen. Oh, okay. Okay. We, we, we will make a decision to... today. I, I do have a question. Okay, he has uh, a question. Of uh, the applicant, I wouldn't dare to butcher your name. <laughs> um, La Monica. <laughs> There, in one of these letters to us, it says, uh, it also appears the homeowner has had electrical run to the sheds. Um, this needs to be looked into. Unless I'm mistaken, a permit should have been pulled for the electrical and it's close to the water. The question of ability of the sheds being used as sheds. They have the potential to be used as guest homes as are done in RV campgrounds. Okay, there's an extension cord run into the sheds because they have lights in there so I could see. So you don't have any any power? There's not, no, there's no no you permanent no power. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. At this time, I'm going to ask the question. There's no one in the audience, but is anyone <laughs> wishing to come forward and speak in favor? <laughs> or anyone wishing to come and speak in opposition? As I said, there's no one else left in the audience, so therefore no one is coming forward. So at this time, we will close the meeting up to the public and then we will open it up for motion and discussion. Madam Chairman, I move that we deny variance uh, 21-004 as the variance does not meet the Criteria required by Section 45-833 of the Putnam County Land Development Code and authorize the chairman to sign the final order. Second. All right, we have a motion and second to deny variance 21-004. All in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, motion carries. Uh, there is a 30-day, motion carries 5-0. However, there is a 30-day appeal process. So um, if you need to continue, then please follow your own instincts. And then if you have some other questions, I'm sure staff will be more than willing to work with you. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next thing, any old business, any new business, the next thing is the minutes for August 18th, 2021. Has everybody had a chance to read them? Move, approve, second. Uh, we have a motion to and a second to approve August 18th, 2021 meeting. So all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 5-0. I guess we stand adjourned. How about in a motion? Can Just to be official. Motion on the protest? <laughs> yeah. Okay, motion to adjourn. Thank you.